Hello, amateurs. Welcome back to another episode of Hot Topics. And I've got Dick and Moon with me again today. Dick and how are you doing? I'm good. Good, thanks, Tim. Welcome back to the pod. Long-time listeners, you'll know Dick has been on a few times before. The original episodes were numbers 82 and 83. So if you want to find out all about him, go back and listen to those ones. But today we are talking about the continuing saga at grassroots level rugby in the UK. So Dick, and just give a brief intro to people who might not have heard from you before about who you are in mm. relation specifically to what we're about to talk about today. Yes, so I'm the director of rugby at London Cornish. Um, I'm, uh, I've just completed my 21st season in the role. Um, and uh, in that time, I've seen us go from rise from level 11, I think, up to level six. And we've just slipped back down to level seven. I've been fortunate enough as well to get involved with the uh, uh, Bill Beaumont uh, County Championship side uh, that Cornwall have had in, in recent seasons and um, been very fortunate to have any exposure to uh, the Cornish rugby scene uh, whenever I get the opportunity. Fantastic. Now, listeners will probably know that at this point I, I've got a long list of sort of questions and topics that I've got ready to go, but... I'm going to throw this all over to you, mate, because I know you've got some things that you really want to talk about. Yeah, and it falls loosely into two brackets. The first, um, uh, and in no particular order here, is the uh, restructure of the leagues that we are now two seasons into. Um, and there was a review of these this restructure hard-baked into the RFU's um, uh, communication um, for post-season three, so that's after the end of next season. Um, and the other thing I want to talk about is the tackle height reduction um, and and its failings, quite frankly. Um, uh, we, both of these things I, I have flagged previously, both in our conversations, Tim, you and I have had on the Amateur Rugby podcast and in writing in the rugby paper in an article uh, in 2022 as well. Um, and I want to begin with the, um, uh, the restructure that happened um, uh, uh, in 2022. Um, this was based on feedback the RFU received from players in the main. Um, and the, uh, the edict was that it was to reduce the amount of games players had, to reduce travel, thereby to encourage players to stay in the game, um, and to reduce the churn of teams through different leagues. I think it's failed on every single count. Um, and uh, and I want to take, first of all, the basis on which this restructure uh, was done. The RFU surveyed players. Um, and uh, obviously, when you run a survey, you only get responses from those people that reply. So actually, to say all players is not true, but hidden in the RFU's own statistics, and it's not easy to find, so I actually kept a copy of it, 62% of players thought that 20 to 26 games was just about the right amount. Now, we were in a world where levels 5 and 6 were 26 games. So those were 14 team leagues with a one-up and one-into-a-playoff promotion. So that's the first thing. Now we're in a league where you have 12 teams and there's only one up. There is no longer is there any um, uh, playoff. So bear in mind, 12-team leagues is 22 games. The RFU, their own stats say 62% of players thought the 20 to 26 games is the right amount. So actually, there was never any support for a reduction in numbers of games in those statistics alone. And interestingly, again, the RFU's own statistics, 39% of players at levels 5, 6, and 7 thought that 20 to 23 games a season was the right amount. Just listen to that statistic. 39% thought 20 to 23 games, therefore a 12-team, 22-game season was the right amount. That means 61% of players didn't think a reduction in numbers of games from 26 down to 22 was appropriate. So the RFU's own statistics didn't support what they were about to do. Furthermore, when you look at the way the structure has been done, 
it just demonstrates that somebody at headquarters doesn't understand rugby clubs. You have six level five leagues falling into 12 level six leagues, falling into 18 level seven leagues. Those are all organized on a geographical basis. Now, let's just have a think about that from a statistical point of view. With six level five leagues, that means 12 teams come down into the 12 level six teams. Okay? Okay, I'm no problem with that. Those That structure works. But beneath that, you now have 18 level seven leagues. When you promote the top 18 teams into 12 leagues, it doesn't take an idiot to point out there's a six-team mismatch. So what the RFU have done is are also promoting the six second-best-placed teams in the country. So immediately, you have disparities on a regional basis at level six. Now think about what impact that has on the twenty-four. Uh, sorry, on the twelve teams coming down from five to six, because they come down, but there are a disparate number of clubs coming up into the leagues into which they're coming. So effectively, what you have to do is you have to throw all of the teams at level six up in the air and redraw the leagues every single season. That is a complete nonsense. I'm going to take the, t- the league in which London Cornish played this last season. Regional 2 South East, it's called. In 2023, at the end of that season, the teams in 1st, 2nd, 8th, 9th, 11th and 12th were all changed from that league. Half the league changed. For the third season running, London Cornish and Cobham were moved in the leagues. They don't call them level transfers. We were placed into a new league. This league, by the way, Tim, it had old Colfians in it, so um, uh, of real interest to you, was an absolute beast of a league. Because once you remove the four of the bottom five teams from a league and promote into it one champion team in Old Alanians, who not only went straight through the league, but were also cup winners, but you also relegated into it three of the teams coming down from level six, or from level five, sorry. So essentially, the, 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 there wasn't a natural filter of where those clubs, you know, it should be they come neatly into constituent leagues, but no, they lumped them all in that league. So suddenly you had an absolute monster of a league. The only league I might add in the country, the only one in the country where every single team entered the cup. And I'm going to come back to the cups. So you have this beast of a league. We finished sixth in regional two Thames the season before. We were no worse this season, and yet we finished bottom. So you get this this awful situation where there's a massive disparity between the calibre of the level six leagues. Now, the RFU, I know, are very keen to stop clubs spending money on players. But when you only promote one club, In fact, all you're doing is making it more difficult for aspirational clubs that are purely amateur to make it out of those leagues. And so the ones that are aspirational and aren't bothered about being amateur are going to pay players. In Regional 2 Southeast, I have it on good authority that a couple of clubs just paid players long enough to ensure they weren't relegated. Now, I'm not going to name them, but you have a look at the results of a few of the sides in our league. Two things happened. Either they won until they were safe and then they hardly won again afterwards, or they lost until their point where they thought, we'd better not go down, we're going to do something about it. They did something about it, and now they're safe. You have a look at the results, you read into it what you will. And that is the behaviour that the RFU is driving with this structure. It is, frankly, a bugger's muddle of a reorg, and it needs to be set right. And I'm putting this appeal out there a year ahead of it happening to say, RFU, I will happily help you. And I know there are people in each of the regions, similarly deep experience in the grassroots game, who are passionate about it, who will do similarly. It cannot continue in a situation where you have this awful muddle where clubs do not know what league they're going to go up into or down into every single season. As a director of rugby, next season, I now stand looking at a fourth different league in four seasons. Last season, I was going into Buckinghamshire. I was going into um, 
uh, Middlesex. I was going into Hampshire. I was going into Berkshire. I was going all over the place. This season, I've been going to Surrey. I've been going into Kent. Next season, I go down to Sussex or, or Surrey. And that is a complete nonsense. That's not lineated in any kind of structure. It's, it's a, a horrible, horrible mess, quite frankly. So that's the first thing. This, this mess of a league is is uh, is not helpful and i suspect there will be other regions where similar things are happening and other levels that that are um uh, uh the, with which people are not happy i only know about five six seven and down uh, so i speak about those with experience and i am purely amateur by the way i want to make this clear because i have no there is no um uh, ulterior motive here i am unpaid i've never claimed expenses i'm not interested in that I do this because I absolutely love the game of rugby. So I talk here from my passion for the game. Um, Can I just ask you a question on that? You yeah. mentioned there five, six, seven, which is a really important level of the game, in my opinion. No, that, that, that kind of serious social level. Um, yeah. Can can you see? I know you don't have experience with it, but could could you see that there are benefits above and below that with the new structure, or or do you just think it's it's a mess throughout? I think there are benefits. Um, th th there is another challenge, which, which I want to come to, which is this. We now have um, two other things that are factoring into the leagues that the RFU are aware of and trying to do something about, but it, it, it's their own mess. So the first thing is second teams have entered the leagues, and they only go up to level seven. Now, remember what I said about teams, 18 teams at level seven um, being promoted out of the 18 leagues, the winners. And that the seams in second, the best six go up. However, if the team in first or the team is second is a second team, they can't, and nor should they, in my opinion, be promoted. So you're going to get situations where the teams in third are going to get promoted in some leagues and be nowhere near good enough for that step up. Now, I've never been a fan of second teams. I think if you, you know, there are some clubs in London that are incredibly powerful. If you allow them to get into the league system any higher than they are, it will destroy clubs in near localities to them, absolutely destroy them. And, and it's really important that instead of allowing that to happen, there is a proper structure for second team clubs to play in that is competitive. And I'm sorry if that means they have to travel further. If these are big clubs big enough to have that caliber of player, then that's the price they have to pay. The third thing that we're seeing, and I need to be careful about this, is professional clubs going bust and restarting their amateur teams at a lower level. Now, I'm going to use Jersey as an example. I am very aware that the lads at Jersey are not paid. Okay, the lads at the Jersey are not paid, but that's not the point. Five or six of the Jersey squad that have just won the level, I think it's six um, uh, league that they are in. They went straight through it. Were in the professional side that went bust. You've seen that happen at London Welsh as well. It's not about those lads getting paid. Uh, uh, okay, they don't get paid. They've landed jobs in Jersey or in London or whatever, but they are absolutely disproportionately uh, changing the balance of the team that they're in and right, raising that team well above its natural level. Um, and you're going to see it. You've seen it with Richmond. They've come all the way down, gone all the way back through. You're going to see it with the other clubs now that have gone bust, I suspect, unless they throw them in higher up, I suspect they'll go bust and pile their way back through. Uh, you're going to see it with Jersey, um, uh, and it's a repeated pattern. Uh, and it, it, it's a worry for me. It's a real worry because you're going to get mismatches um, and some horrendously lopsided results, and you're already seeing that, I think. So that's that's the other the other point I'd make about just, the other point. Just points. to be clear on that, what the professional clubs have done, uh, or the, those former clubs, they have their professional arm and they have their amateur team, right? And, and what they've done is when the professional team goes bust, they take essentially the uh, league position of the amateur side and carry on from there. Yeah, though perhaps not paying them. So, so they they are truly amateur. I get that. I know, I, I know Jerseys. Uh, you know, there are one or two of the lads there that I I know or know of, um, and I get that they're playing for the love, and I know that. And and I guess it's really hard in Jersey. It's not like you can just ship across to Guernsey and, and play there in National Two. Um, 
although I think one has, um, you know, th those guys, you know, it, it, it's, it's really hard. We're seeing it as a repeated pattern. So now I go back to this whole point about aspirational clubs that are amateur. The reason it's important is it means that there is now a log jam in certain divisions where those ex pro clubs go through of clubs that have genuinely tried hard to do everything by the rules and within the rules and are being having clubs fly past them. And I, as a director of rugby, for me, you know, one of the things I look at season on season is how I can plot my way out of a league. Um, I, I didn't necessarily want that to be downward, but ideally, uh, you know, we, we, we go up and, and you know, it's a, a league, the league we're, we've fallen into is a hell of a league. There are some great teams in there. I don't think for a minute we're going to walk through that league. Um, uh, and, you know, I expect it to be very competitive um, and it will be tough. But I worry that whoever wins that league won't know what league they'll go up into next season, the, sorry, the following season. And we'll find it really hard, given our location, to be able to plot their way through that league the following year because you cannot tell who you're going to be playing against, what counties you're going to be going to until you know quite late before the season starts. And it changes season on season. Now, I, I, I need to be clear that the, the guys that put the leagues together each season – and there are four of them, one in each region of the country. This is not on them. Those four guys are all volunteers. They do a magnificent job. And it's it's thankless because they get an awful lot of flack from people for what they do. They've been lumbered with it. It wasn't them that made the original decisions on the structure of the league. So uh, I'd like to, first of all, say thank you to all four of them. They know who they are. Um, and and secondly, um, to say that uh, it, it shouldn't be in on their laps in any case. So that is the, the league structure. It, it's something that I'm um, uh, very passionate we do a proper review of. Now, the RSU in their wisdom came up with the idea that you could have national cups as if that was brand new and as if we'd never had them before. We used to have national cups at every single level that ended up with a final at Twickenham. And London Cornish were involved in, in all the ones we could get involved with. Um, and they were weaved through the fabric of the season. Nowadays, when the league season ends, the Cups begin. And only those clubs that actually bother to enter, enter. That's important because on the first weekend, a couple of weeks back, over 60 of the games at all the levels of that Cup competition were walkovers. Mm -hmm. Over 60. And that was just from the clubs that entered. In the second round, there were another plethora of walkovers, including the most extraordinary one uh, in one of the cup competitions. Sandown and Shanklin, who were on the island, obviously, on the Isle of Wight, had a home draw against Old Patesians, my old club in Cheltenham. I mean, a horrendous journey for Old Pats. Absolutely horrendous for a second round. Pats organised a coach, put it all together, and then Sandown and Shanklin gave them a walkover. So this was a trip that Sandan and Shanklin would have had the home benefit of and they gave Old Pats a walkover. If that is not a message to the RFU about these cups, then I don't know what is. Now, my suggestion would be that, uh, and this would have to be weaved into the, a restructure of the restructure, that you give the, a Champions Cup at certain levels um, to all of the winners of the competitions such that they could then uh, play on uh, post the end of the league season. That wouldn't interfere with what I am going to suggest, which is you bring back the playoffs for the second place teams because the second place teams would then continue to have the opportunity to get promoted. You know, by closing the aperture for clubs, aspirational clubs to get promoted, the RFU are making it a cheats charter for clubs that want to get around the paying players thing. Um, and I think they need to revisit that. I really do. I think London Cornish have been involved in three playoffs in my time here, and they've been fantastic occasions. We've lost two of them, and um, I, I, I've made great friends. By the way, Sandown and Shanklin were one of the ones we won, um, and they're a great and amazing rugby club, and I've got a lot of time for them. Um, you know, For them, for example, um, having a one-off playoff was a great occasion. But then asking them to go and play week in, week out in a cup competition at the end of the season, it's just not sustainable. Um, so, uh, you know, I want them to revisit those cups. If they really want to have something, 
have them for the winners of the leagues, bring back playoffs at the levels that we had them at. Let's restructure the league on a more uh, predictable level so that teams know where they're going and, and, and how they get promoted and where they're going into the next season. Um, uh, uh, so that's it on the, the league structure. It's something that we, we have a year more to, to, to uh, absorb. Um, and, and I really appealed to the RFU to, um, uh, to revisit this. And I had emailed Bill Sweeney and, and Bill, you know, you'll back this up. I had an email conversation with him right when this started and said, this isn't going to work. Here's why. Um, and, uh, you know, I, and the RFU council, I know there's an awful lot of you chaps. I don't know how many of you watch the podcast. If you don't, you should, um, uh, you know, you guys are not getting the messages you need to hear. Rugby at this level cannot be organized by people who are not from rugby clubs. And I know there are some people involved in that reorg that are not rugby club people. It needs to be done with the help of, the support of, the grassroots folks who run those clubs. Anyway, that's that bit of the rant over. Um, the second thing, the tackle height. I was really anti the way this was brought in. I think it, by common consent, the RFU accept that the communication around this being brought in the way it was, was hasty and, um, uh, and ill-advised. However, the point I made at the time, both in the consultations, when the RFU bring a consultation out, you know damn well that they're not actually consulting. They made a decision that's going through. Um, uh, and maybe just change the name of it from consultation to, to, to something else, RFU, so that, you know, it, just say what it is. Um, implementation would probably be a better word. So when this was brought in, we were given no notice. By that, I mean it was coming in the, the next season. You wouldn't barely have a pre-season to get it through. And my worry was that you were imposing this on players who've been, since they were very young, coached a certain way. And you cannot re-coach muscle memory that quickly, particularly for amateur clubs who may only train once a week. At the time, my concern was that you're asking players to lower their heads around the level of hip bones and knee bones, and that actually there would be an issue with concussions there as much as the reduction from players getting their heads up here, which I fully support, um, uh, you know, would reduce the concussions. There was an unintended consequence, which I didn't think of. And it took me to review the information packs that the RFU sent out to see where the floor was. In a league game a few weeks ago at London Cornish, two of our players went into a tackle with a, a lad. One came in one side and one came in the other. They smacked heads together. I've reviewed the VO of this three or four times. And actually what happens is one tries to, tries to lower the level of his tackle to comply with the new law. The other was already at the right level. What you've in fact done is you've now forced players when they're more than one of them is tackling to put their head in a far narrower, narrower part of the tackle player's body than was ever the case before. The upshot unfortunately, was one of my players suffered a brain hemorrhage. The other was concussed. Now, I sit here, thankfully, having had a text with him. Some, the incident happened three weeks ago. He's off work for months. You know, there's tremendous damage that's done. And my, my, my worry is that we are not getting this right because you cannot outlaw more than one player tackling, but it cannot be right that we have now reduced the area in which players can tackle into such a small area that catastrophic injuries, not concussions, catastrophic injuries are far more likely to happen. And I think that's where we are. I sit here thinking to myself, the season before this was brought in, we already had it lower than it was before. And we'd seen a massive reduction in the number of concussions at London Cornish. This season, the number of concussions has risen slightly. But what price is any number of concussions against a catastrophic injury? And I don't, I ask that without an answer. But I do know this, it isn't right in its current format. It's very difficult for those people who've played the game for long periods of time to suddenly make this change. 
And I think we need to look at it again to find out what you can do to support players when two of them go into a tackle. And, you know, I, I um, uh, you know, I hope and pray that we're not in a situation where some other club has something more unfortunate than the incident we have had. Um, but it, it didn't occur to me. Now, when you look at the RFU's information they sent out, in the bottom left-hand corner is a picture of, from the women's game um, of two people. And what you'll see is one of them lowering her head, trying to get to the height at which the green part of the body is the acceptable level. It is almost exactly what happened. The other player coming from the blind side, if you carried that picture on, it's almost like they've written what's going to happen. And so the RFU have actually demonstrated this is a likelihood and a possibility in their own literature. And so I would ask, you know, the people that have looked at this to look at this again, and perhaps you can find a better way than I can of allaying my fears that we're heading for catastrophic injuries with the way that the tackle law is currently set. Now, you know, it's different at, uh, at the national league level. I think there has a different approach. I'd be interested to know whether that has brought uh, 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 any change in both behavior and, um, and concussions. Uh, there's certainly more discussion to be had in my view from where we are right now. And, and I do think that if you're coaching the younger player, like the, the, the age groups, to play with this law from the get-go that maybe they can find a way as they grow through the league, through the age groups of adapting their behavior. But I think in the game in which we play, the adult male game, I need to be clear that I only talk here with experience of the adult male game. And I know there are other parts of the, the game that are growing tremendously. Um, but in the adult male game, you're asking people, who have had a long career, many of them, of being coached in a certain way to suddenly change their behavior. And what you're seeing is them in split seconds making decisions to try and lower that tackle height. And in doing so, it's endangering them. Yeah. Firstly, I hope your player is okay and makes a, a full recovery. My thoughts are with him. Thanks, um, secondly, like, do you feel like maybe the genie's already out of the bottle now and it's going to be too difficult to put it back in? Or do you think it's going to be a modification of where we're at at the moment? I'd like to see a modification. I really would. I think we've gone too low too quickly. Um, I, I think, you know, it seems to me that referees have refereed this in very different ways through the season. I understand that. The referees have had to adapt just as quickly as the players have. Um and I, I fully support the need for us to remove the head-on-head -head collisions of the tackled player and the tackler. But we haven't talked about, and we need to talk about, two tackle player, two tacklers on a tackle player, because that is not covered in the work that has been put into the tackle height issue. And it's something I didn't think of at the time. And now I'm unfortunately only too aware of it. Yeah, I've got to say, just through an anecdotal thing, like I've got a fair bit of scar tissue on this side of my face, and they are all from head-on-head head head, friendly fire collisions around the back of the tackle, like you've just uh, explained. The ones that you, you don't see coming, essentially. Right. Are probably the ones that are potentially more dangerous for you as well. Um, yeah, I mean, any any sort of closing thoughts, Dick, on, or, or any sort of other bits you want to mention? I think, uh, you know, that there's a lot of attention focused on um, what the RFU are doing with the championship and with the premiership. Every time the RFU does something with the championship, the premiership, it has a knock-on effect, a ripple effect, if you like, all the way down. I'll give you an example. So Jersey dropped out of the championship this year. Unbeknownst to many, many clubs, the ripple effect was felt all the way down with something called the Jersey Reprieve. At National 1, it meant only two teams going down, not three. At National 2, it meant that the best record of the second-placed bottom side across the country will stay up. And the same applied at Level 6 as well and Level 5. So I think it was... It looks like it might be Hull Ionians at level four. It looks like it will be, um, uh, um, I think, Horsham um, at level five. 
And at level six, I think it's Kirby Lonsdale, if I'm right. Now, again, that's not on the RFU, the jersey going bust. But my point is this. If you then bring in a load more clubs that have fallen out of the league at the championship level to bolster that back up to 14, it has an impact all the way down the league structure. It has it, And every time you make a change at those higher levels, all people think about is the professional game. But it has an impact into the semi-professional game, if you want to call it that, and right the way down into grassroots. And every season we're seeing this. Every season there is some other algorithm-like way that something else changes that makes it really hard for the grassroots. Um, and I'd really like the championship and the premiership to actually talk to us and let us know what you're thinking. I've also heard the national leagues are thinking of going from three to four at national two, which absolutely fine. But again, think of the impact that has lower down. What will that do um, uh, to the clubs lower down? And that national one may be split into two. Again, you know, what does that do to the structure lower down? It hauls teams up. It changes all of the structure. So again, if we're going to review the structure at the end of next season, Let's do it in the round, understanding what the picture is for all of the leagues in the RFU pyramid, because every time you make a change higher up, it has a ripple effect that is an unintended consequence for those of us lower down. Yeah. Okay. I think we'll leave it there, mate. These are really important points, and I hope somebody at the RFU is listening. Uh, that would be great. And also, people who are listening, even if you're not involved in the RFU, get involved in the comments or share it to somebody and, and make sure these messages get out because I do think they're very important. The league structure one in terms of you know club sustainability and just sort of having some structure around what you're doing. And then obviously the safety around the tackle height is incredibly important as well. So thank you, Dick, and I really appreciate your time today. Thanks, Tim. Thanks for the opportunity. No problem. People watching at home, you can subscribe over there somewhere. You can watch that one next. And don't forget to get out and play.